Nobody asked for another podcast. So here you go. This is yet another Infra Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our 10th episode of Yet Another Infra Podcast. I'm your host, Vitaly Goran, co founder and CEO of Ferris AI. We have a very special company culture episode for you today. We're lucky to be joined by Corp Mackey, CEO of Fly.io, Jordan Tigani, co founder and CEO of Modern Duck, and Guido Appenzeller, who started two companies and is currently a special advisor at A16Z. We'll be covering everything star founders should know about culture, how to start one, how to adapt one, and which companies have our favorite cultures. Hope you enjoy. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our special culture episode. So I would like first for all three of you to introduce yourself and say maybe what does culture mean to you? Hi, I'm Jordan Tagani. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Mother Duck. I spent a long time at Google. I worked at places that had amazing culture. I've worked at places that had highly toxic culture. And so this is something that is incredibly important to me and actually was what drove me to start a company in the first place. I was trying to find a place that I would want to work. And for me, that was like some place that would have the kind of culture where I'd want to work. And it's just really hard to figure that out ahead of time. And so like, if you start your own company, then at least I can't complain about the culture. It might not be exactly what I'd hoped it to be, but at least it would be whatever we can make it. I do think that the culture is really kind of the blueprint for how a company works together and how it feels to work there. I think the one way of thinking about a tech startup is that it's a machine for turning years in, into money and kind of how you source the raw materials is the culture. There's just a lot of really good engineers can work anywhere. And so if you want to find the best of those and the best of those for what you want to do, then you have to have the right kind of organization, the right kind of culture. And I think values and mission and culture all contribute to that. Hi, I'm Kurt. I'm the CEO of Fly.io. We're building a developer public cloud for running your apps close to people. I have a long and sordid memory of anything involving culture. It doesn't mean much by itself. And I tended to apply that to, hey, we're going to go out and get drunk after this. Or, or these are people that I'd like to play video games with. Or these are people I'd literally marry. And if you wouldn't literally marry a person you're hiring, you shouldn't have that person, which always felt a little off to me. As I've gotten older and arguably more experienced. I've started to repurpose the word, which is funny to say repurpose. In my own brain, I've repurposed this word and started trying to define culture as basically what people do within the organization to make the company get to where we want it to go. And in some ways, a lot of what I think about this is what do people do when you're not there and how does it work? And so there's the idea of what I want people to do when I'm not there. And then there's the reality of what actually happens when I'm not there. And I think a lot of the culture work is bringing those things together. And so it's hopefully more than getting drunk after work in 2023. Yeah, I'm Guido Appenzell. I currently special advisor at Andreessen Horowitz, but I started two companies and then worked in some larger companies. And for me, ultimately culture is something that's very closely entwined with how a company works or what it's trying to achieve, right? So ideally, culture is an expression of how you work together for the goals that you're trying to achieve. The cases where I've seen culture go off the rails the worst, I think, was in large companies where these things get completely disconnected, right? Where you basically have people that are trying to do culture in a vacuum that has nothing to do with actually what happens on the ground and how the average engineer thinks, uh, thinks about a problem. But at the end of the day, I like the definition of sort of culture is what happens if nobody's watching and people are going to have to do, make decisions by themselves, right? It's really the sort of the thing that's ingrained in people is not explicitly spelled out as rules or it just has been internalized over time and that makes an organization work together in a cohesive way and move forward. Awesome. And folks, usually you know me as the moderator, but I'm also the CEO of a 25-person company for CI. We do kind of an infrastructure for engineering operations. But beforehand, I ran a large engineering organization, a Salesforce, where I got my first taste of what happens when culture doesn't work. And then similar to Jordan, I started a company to try it from scratch and without having this Uber corporation that kind of forces some of their cultural values on me. And I agree with most of the things that were said here. I would just add on top of it, I also believe that culture is in many ways is a company's positioning. So the same way that we want to position our product and say, these are the type of users that this product is good for, and these are the type of users the product is not great for. The same thing is also can be said about culture and potential employees, and you can define yourself on what type of employees you want to attract. So Jordan, I think you also mentioned that you used to work for Google and 
it's one of these organizations that a lot of people actually look from the outside, admire. How does that affect your view on culture as of today? Yeah, I think it's really popular these days to shit on Google, but I think there was something that at least in the early days that they did, it was great. They had a reel that 10 things was something that people really took seriously. One of those was uh, don't be evil. And I know everybody rolls their eyes when they say that and they think about, oh, Google did this horrendously evil thing, but it really permeated the organization and would be just, you'd be at a meeting and somebody like, no, we shouldn't do that because that's, that's not googly. And I can hear the eyes rolling already. And the other panelists have nicely controlled their emotions as I said that, but it absolutely did happen. And it was also something that, you know, when I was considering coming to work at Google, you could just feel there was something in the place, something special. I really attribute that to the culture. I actually didn't want to work at Google. I said, I never want to work at a large company again. And I came in and I walked in there for my interviews, which I was doing just to practice interviewing. And you could feel like this energy, this like the sense of fun and the sense of, hey, the way people treated each other. And I interviewed at other places and I was like, eh, this place just seems dull and flat. And regardless of the like business outcome, I interviewed in early days at Snowflake and that could have been a very lucrative career choice for me, but I would not have switched it because I really liked the job day to day because of the way people treated each other that I don't think I would have gotten at a different. Guido, a lot of the Google culture is said to be for maybe on kind of the Stanford University campus culture and you spend many of your years on that campus. So maybe you can also talk a little bit about that and other perhaps cultural influences you had. Oh, that's true. And coming back to Google, there's a funny story that actually helped Larry and Sergey write the original business plan back in, in the late 90s. So it was like two afternoons. So my contribution to Google is still if it is small, but we had a lot of fun. And I think to some degree, Stanford culture did the very early Google culture a little bit, like this idea of that they, you have a very open discourse, your good ideas need to be discussed, right? The do no evil part, right? A lot of the people that they hired at the beginning came from Stanford or from an academic environment, like or who I think set some of the early engineering culture. So I think that certainly contributed. I think Google did an incredible job in creating this sort of engineering driven, we're looking for really smart people, we're doing very ambitious engineering products. I think Larry was somebody who was always questioning and any, anything that other people would assume as the default or the status quo. He's always like, okay, let's, let me just ex understand why. And it was always questioning in a very sort of friendly and open way, if there wasn't a way to do this in a better way. And I think that's also moved to uh, shape Google in the early days when they start building their own data center equipment, which back then nobody else was doing. So I think that was all great. Let me turn this question a little bit around, Jordan. Google. If I look, everybody's shitting on Google. I don't want to do that. But I, if, I, if I'm getting a little bit of controversy here, if I look at AI for the last year or so, Google in terms of actually last five years, Google in terms of research breakthroughs has been incredible, right? The Transformer paper, Diffusion, I think at Google co-authors on it. They were pretty much there for all the major breakthroughs and hasn't been, haven't managed to launch a single product right, in that space, right? External facing at least, right? Internal, internal they have, but external facing. How did that happen? There's something I think changed in, in the culture at some point. If you look more generally, Google does not have a great record in building their own products. They're great in acquiring them and making them big and scaling them. But is that also partly a result of that culture or is there something that went wrong? Is there something that changed? What do you think? I think culture can be good for employees, but not necessarily good for the business. It can be make it a good place to work. I think there was an old meme that was going around that Google, the, the highest priority was engineers. At Amazon, the highest priority was the customer. And at Microsoft, the highest priority was the business. And like, those are all three different ways of building a trillion dollar company. But I think also, depending on your priority, it can prevent you from doing certain things. I think Google has, the culture has, they've lost its way a little bit in the last few years. And certainly coming from Google Cloud, I've seen that happen. But if you go all the way back to like MapReduce, the same thing is like, they invented MapReduce, but they did not popularize, had to be built elsewhere. And there was a number of papers that, and things that they did that were dramatically impactful on the world of technology, but Google wasn't actually able to capitalize on it. And does that come from culture? Probably comes from sort of this sort of way of looking at things. On the other hand, at least they turned those ideas over to the world and they published those papers rather than hiding them and not letting them see the light of day. It's actually interesting because I have an outsider's perspective of Google from basically over the entire length of Google. And it's been interesting to hear from people that work there and also see outside. The thing that always struck me is that it's don't be evil. I'm not going to say it, but to the whole don't be evil meme, 
is obviously right from the outside. It's like, obviously no, what company is going to be like, no, actually be evil. I'm sure there is one, but it's not like we're all like sitting here comparing Google and some other anti Google that's of equivalent size. And one of the things I've realized as I've started working on my own companies is that those kinds of values are hard to express externally, I think, because they sound very flippant. And I'm guessing there's a lot more nuance and a lot more kind of grit behind something like that within the company. Tell me more about that. Like, how did that manifest? Like, how was it important within Google versus just being a meme externally? But I recently saw the, there's a docudrama about Uber, super pumped. I don't know that it was a fantastic show, but as somebody who's trying to build a company, it was fascinating to just see how they built a huge company, but in a very different way. And so I would say that they might've said, who gives a fuck if you're being evil, as long as more people get in our cars. We're willing to sacrifice some kind of moral high ground, kind of put it mildly, but getting back to culture and values, it's uh, the things that guide you when you have to make hard decisions. And there were some hard decisions. They did decide to move out of China, like as a business decision, that was probably a bad business decision. But as like, in order for us to stay in China, we have to do some things that would be morally compromising. And yes, they were in China for a while and they didn't always 100% adhere to the letter or the spirit, but it was something that you could really see was important in driving how they were making decisions. And even we would be in meetings, like early days of BigQuery, it was like the reason export is free in BigQuery is because like we said, hey, we don't want to lock up your data. Like when I was at Microsoft, we'd be like, we totally want to lock up your data. We don't want you to be able to get it out. If you want to get it out, you have to pay us a lot of money. But at Google was like, hey, like, we don't want to be evil. If you try it, you don't like it. You can take your data wherever you want for free. I think that one of the things as I've, I've expressed my skepticism of defined company values a lot over the last 15 years to people. And someone finally told me to basically shut the fuck up. And they're like, listen, like if it doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't mean anything to you, but you should actually sit down and think about times things went wrong and what went wrong. And what happened? And like, there might be a principle there you can extract it from, which I thought was fascinating. I've started being much more interested in when, almost like when companies didn't do the thing they said was important. And then what happened afterwards? I think it's incredibly interesting learning. I think it's actually a really good point that often what I've seen that sort of the cultural values that say what you're against are more powerful than the ones that say what you're for, right? So you're like, hey, we're all for world peace, right? That's really helpful for me to make a decision as an engineer, right? But if you're saying like, look, here's something specific, which our competitor does, which we don't do, right? That usually has a little bit of teeth, right? That sort of really helps distinguish and differentiate. Yeah, so I think one of the best examples for this principle is Facebook. They have the move fast and break things. And actually, it's not so much what you're against, but what are you willing to sacrifice? And so, for example, at Ferris and Prior to that, also kind of at Salesforce, we took that framework and for every value that we support, we actually are trying to find the re reverse value. So make the values reversible where the opposite is also makes sense, right? For example, don't be evil is not a great one because like, I don't think there are many companies that say, oh, our positioning is we're evil. So we have things like uh, move fast over perfection. Then that is what we're telling you basically as a management team to the company. That is what we're willing to sacrifice in order to meet. And that's uh, taken from this agile manifesto for those uh, this whole uh, individual interactions over processes and tools and kind of things like that. And that's how we do it. And I'm actually curious if anyone also tried to do something like that. I think it's interesting to also figure out what would the alternative be? And because I think one of the nice things about describing your values is it lets you measure whether you think a candidate actually aligns with those values. I saw some archival footage of Steve Jobs and he was talking about, you want to find people with your same values because when you share those values, then those are people that are headed in the same direction. So you don't have to convince them where you want to go. So all your energy can be focused on how to get there. And I think that's a really nice way of describing it. And I think if there's not a reasonable person who would be not the value, then it's hard to say that this is actually a meaningful value. To get back to the super pumped thing, like series opens with Kalanick is asking like an interview candidate, are you an asshole? And then they cut away. And then throughout the episode, it becomes clear that the correct answer is yes. And I think that's a super interesting sort of values question because a lot of places, is, if someone is an asshole, even if they're the best engineer on the team, you should fire them. And it's clear that you can actually run a successful company where the opposite is true. Is It's like being an asshole and being willing to be the asshole is actually a benefit. So another thing about that is there is a lot of time spent on trying to wordsmith what is the perfect value sounds. But Guido, you actually said on the server, 
that the problem with culture is not so much like whether we pick the right words, is how it's actually getting implemented in practice. So I would love to hear more thoughts there. Look, I, in my experience, startups are actually reasonably good in building a culture and they're often not very explicit about it. So if it permeates, right, often the founders have a disproportional influence. It's, it should be a fairly tightly knit team, specifically at the beginning. You're sort of off to a pretty good start there. I think the worst offenders when it comes to the culture debate going horribly wrong is what I've seen in large companies, right? Because often there's like a huge disconnect between sort of what's happening on the ground and what HR th puts on the motivational poster in terms of what the culture is for the company, right? I recall distinctly one, one conversation I had with a, with a CIO where they were talking about how they want to create more of a software culture. It's a cloud native software culture and everything. In the next sentence, they're saying that they're thinking about banning MacBooks for reasons of cost. They're banning Slack because it's not secure. You can't even use it with external parties. You can't host anything in the cloud also for security reasons. This is a few years ago. So this is not early 2010s. This is like 2020s. You're looking at it, you go, this is crazy, right? It's like, you're, so the theory of what they want to build, that this is what the aspirational goal, what they're actually doing on the ground are completely orthogonal, right? Not even orthogonal, they're opposite, right? They're going different directions and that can't possibly work. And start startups tend to be a lot better than that. It's just, uh, they're much closer to reality. It's often the culture gets written up after uh, it's instantiated in the organization. That works a lot better. I think that's the part that's interesting. I've talked to people with small startups. They're like six people I'm trying to write down values. And it's always seemed very strange to me because it, it's, what does that even mean yet? We're at 50 some people right now. And it still feels like we just have to act the way we need to act and then derive what that means afterwards sometimes. And regardless of what we plan ahead of time, things are going to come up that we just didn't account for every kind of decision. We actually don't even talk about culture within our company. It's almost like never a word. I think you'll occasionally hear people try and like recruit outsiders and like, this is a great culture, which I'd rather them say something like, this is a place I really enjoy working because of these three things instead of like great culture. I think the only real substantial culture work we've done has been on the hiring process. And it's actually a lot more than picking the right people. A lot of it is how we define jobs and expectations to even kick off the hiring. But at no point still do we have culture. We actually have hiring docs put up publicly now, which turned out to be a good exercise because people are like, I love those. And then, or people have actually had the opposite. People read those and they come back like, this doesn't sound like we're on a work. And it's like, that's a win for both of us. That's great. This is exactly what we want is people to select themselves out sometimes. Yeah. So I'll go on describe the complete opposite of what Kurt just said. For example, for us, we're kind of religious about it, where what do I mean by religious is we have a company team meeting every Monday. And the very first thing is I grab a random person in the company and I test them on our values. That is how every single meeting starts. And the reason is the way I look at it is if as a CEO, I don't get sick of hearing myself talk about it, there is no way it will actually permeate throughout the organization. Like I need to get to the level of that I just can't stand to hear my voice anymore talking about these values. And only then maybe the frontline engineers and salespeople and all that will actually hear about it. But I can tell you that not only that every single meeting where people are, they start repeating the values and they're saying, hey, this is according to our values. This is not according to the values. We just had a story yesterday where one of our employees was talking to his father-in-law about like making coffee and he was saying like, look, this is not about perfection. Like you should move fast over perfection. And they started using it in their regular life. So that was just a, a nice anecdote. But Jordan, we'd love to hear what do you think like really requires a leader to do in order to make those kind of values or culture stick? I think it's a good question. And, and uh, I think it's one interesting thing about, about Kurt and Fly is like from an outsider's perspective, that actually looks like a meticulously maintained culture. And I think that the reason is your personality and how you lead that company shapes the way that company looks and feels because it's the team that you put together. It's the things that you reward, the way you talk. And I think culture often reflects the values of the founding team and the early employees. And I think it's the tricky part is like, how do you make sure that the good things about the culture continue as you grow and it doesn't get watered down. I think the question is, how, how do you maintain that? Yeah, so Kurt, how do you plan on keeping Fly this sort of a bit iconoclastic and as interesting of a company as you go forward? Well, wow, that, that's incredibly flattering. But uh, I wanted to tweak wording you just used, which was keep on working, like doing. And I think that one of the things we think about a lot is like, is the work we're doing accomplishing what we wanted it to? which is, I think, a more nuanced version of the key point is, is this actually doing what 
we want. And one thing that I've actually thought about deliberately is, I don't know if you've all spent your entire lives like questioning everything you think is important and being like, oh my God, how could I possibly write about things? And like over time, I've learned to like kind of channel that in like a little cognitive behavioral therapy. I channel that into being very critical about what just happened. Does that make sense? Like very introspective about what just happened, which I think works sometimes. I think it lets us be a little bit more iterative on things than we could be otherwise. I think it's very easy to put a stake in the ground and leave it there and then forget about it and then trip over it four or five years later. And we're pretty okay so far at being self-critical. But I can't tell you how we're going to maintain this in five years. I think that's probably a weakness on my or our parts is that I think that we're right now we're looking at 50 and we're like, what do we want the company to look like at 150, but maybe not at a thousand. And I think that in some ways, like it probably won't be the same. There's a lot that's going to change. And I'm going to have to let go of some sacred ducks or whatever the term we want to use is along the way. And so, yeah, it's like a deeply unsatisfying answer. The other one really important part of this, I think, is it's actually not just me. Like I go on the podcast and talk about things. We have four founders now and we've actually added two late and all four of us are very almost like mind melded on what is important for what we want to do and how we want people to accomplish it. And I think that's the... Probably the only reason it works right now is sort of the amplification of four people's work and not just me, which maybe just means we can go to 200 and we'll be okay. I don't really know. I want to talk briefly about this idea of how do I they change culture? What is the right mechanism to do with my company? How does that change over time? So I remember my, the very first moment, I think when it started clicking with me, how to set culture. And I, this is way back. So I was an undergrad, right? I was uh, had hardly written any lines of code and I was basically started working in a research lab at my local university in Germany on a robotics project. And there was the, the super famous postdoc. He was great and everything. I was running the whole research lab and super accomplished. And I was really looking up to him at that time. And basically he came in one day and basically tools were all over the place. We were doing hardware. There was like empty cups in the sink. And he was like, oh, who's doing this? Uh, look, this is not how we roll. We really want everything to be nice. And he started cleaning up, right? And it was clear that this was absolutely not his job, right? He could have hunted down the person who, who did this and made that person do it. But it was just this clear message like, no, this is important enough that I will waste my time doing this. And I was deeply impressed, right? This is of the leadership, right? If you do, do as I do, not do as I say, is I think more powerful than really than, than anything else that you can do there. I wanted to add something onto that, which is I met a founder yesterday and we were talking about values and culture. And, and he said that one of their values is do the dishes. And yeah. it's just, it doesn't matter who awesome. you are. Like you don't just leave your shit around so that people will clean up after you. It's like actually do the dishes. It sounds like that's something you. He yeah. lived that value back then. Yeah. By the way, funny enough, we have the same one and we call it pick up the trash when you see it. So, yeah. But the, the other interesting thing I think is if an organization gets large, it can be incredibly frustrating for everyone how hard it is to change culture, right? If you have a thousand person organization, it, basically there's two things you can change, your customers and your culture. Right? Or you can change your culture, but expect it to take a decade. It's not something you can do in the short term, right? You often need to swap out a large number of people. And that I think is one of the big strengths of startups that they can busy in industries where the predominant culture is no longer competitive to solve that particular problem, right? They can come in with a new culture, right? And at the end of the day, do this in a much, much more efficient way, attract a much better people. How many times have you heard from people that they don't want to work in a large company, even though the pay is better, they just like a more dynamic startup, right? This is in many cases why I did, this is to some degree why I did startups. This is why many people work at those startups, right? It just tends to be a lot more fun. So I think there's an incredible amount of strength in that. And then the one last thing is when you have a really large organization, how do you make a point that in your employee handbook, something is really important, right? And one, one example, there was a fairly benign statement. We don't do X, Y, Z. Okay, that is not very effective. And doing so is a fireable offense. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that established, you read these things like, yeah, I probably, yeah, I don't usually do that. And you read this afterwards and like, okay, I get it. This is important, right? This is something that this company really cares about. Yeah, let me actually provide some, maybe my thoughts about something that is adjacent to what you said. It's not so much how you change the culture, but how do you know whether your culture is working or not? And this is something that at Salesforce, when we grew from a team of five to like hundreds of people, I started noticing it and I was trying to kind of quantify it in some way. Like, how do we actually measure that the culture achieves what we want? And I'm a very strong believer in, I think, Netflix's kind of statement, which is your values is what you value. And at the end of the day, I think culture has to be tied to compensation. That is really the way. And the way we did it at Salesforce is just one of many, is that we did a 360 kind of performance review of all of our employees. And that was about kind of cultural tenants. Today, actually very effective on meeting. And then when we used to do the promotion cycles, again, large company, the quarterly 
promotion cycles, Jordan, I'm sure you're very well aware of it from Google and stuff. In many cases, the people who would be up for promotion would not meet the cultural tenets. And then as a leader, you can take it in one of two ways. One is say, okay, we should not promote them. But the other way is that what we try to do is saying, maybe actually what we value is something else, because obviously these people, everyone thinks they're amazing and like they get great reviews, but it seems to be that we, we claim that we value some other things. So we actually go and change the values to say, maybe empirically, we actually value those things more because I think this is where kind of the rubber meets the road. I would love to hear more from you, Jordan, about this. So there was an example at Google where one of the best engineers that I've ever worked with, absolutely brilliant, was up for a promotion that he absolutely met and exceeded all of the things you're supposed to get for that promotion. And he didn't get the promotion because he was an asshole. And, and that was made very clear to him was that like, just, it's not the, what you're doing, it's the how, but he took the feedback in stride. It's hard to change, you know, who you are, but he changed the way he interacted with people and got much, much better. And then the next time he got the promotion and then was much better at mentoring people. And so it's not just like that. It was like, okay, this cultural bar, he was a better leader because of it as a, an engineering leader, because people were looking up to him, not just because they didn't, but they were afraid of his wrath. But they were looking up to him because like he was helping them and he was able to become a force multiplier by changing the how and not necessarily the what. And I think the cultural aspects really are the how and not the what. I actually love that example because I think the most special people that I've ever worked with are the ones that can get incredibly risky feedback, like stop being an asshole effectively and basically internalize it and do something about it. I think it's an amazing person who can do that because in my experience, it's rare. Like I have a relatively small sample size, but I would say of maybe 20 people I've ever interacted with. And this is maybe a knock on me, not giving them like feedback the right way. But there were two I, that I distinctly remember. And I knew five seconds after it was very much, oh, I don't want it to be that way. Let me work on that. Again, we don't have values yet or anything, but we've been thinking hard about, about in some ways, like how to talk to people and how to absorb people who aren't by default, really good at the things we think are important. Because I have this feeling that the people who've had to deliberately learn to do certain things are going to be much, much better at creating that sort of second order effect across the rest of the company. So it's an excellent example. I love it. We do. Now that you transition a little bit to the dark side, I'm actually curious. Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious. There are some cultures and it doesn't have to be venture capital. It can be even sales where like your example might be even more profound. What happens if you're a star performer and it's very quantifiable, right? There is no doubt about it. You're the top salesperson or you're the top partner at a firm and they'll, people might not like you. I heard Ben Horvitz also talk about, we maybe keep the bus waiting for one special person or it's like zero is the only kind of possible. I, look, this is a hard question. One thing is, if your company gets large, right, the cultural diversity, and I don't mean by like countries, although that too, just the diversity in different work styles increases, right? If you have a, say, uh, you know, SVP of enterprise sales scale to catering to Wall Street, and he has exactly the same culture as your principal engineer, you probably have a huge problem, right? That's not going to work. And in some degrees, I think this explains why it's so hard for Google, for example, to build an effective cloud sales organization out of their classic engineering organization, right? They have a strong consumer culture, so big ticket direct sales is just a very different mindset. Mindset. So I think as you get larger, you have to basically compartmentalize that a little bit. So like, look, the sales guys, we love them, but they just run a little bit differently from the finance guys and they run differently from the engineers. And you tolerate different behaviors, right? If you're salespeople, you hire some finance team to double check their expense reports. And I've expected that some of them you occasionally need to tell that that was a bit much and deny one. But the engineers, that usually never happens, right? It's just different styles. To what extent can you tolerate outliers or assholes or whatever they may be? I think it really depends. And what I've seen is if somebody is really toxic, you need to get them out, right? And I'm not sure I've ever afterwards said, man, I really shouldn't have fired that asshole. Usually I always, man, I waited way too long. I, I didn't do this earlier. This feels so much better now that I did that. On the other hand, if somebody is just difficult to manage in the sense that they don't communicate well, they don't integrate with the team, but fundamentally they're a reasonably nice person, that you can often do. And I found personally that if specifically as a first level engineering manager, if you have somebody that was good at managing difficult people, you have a lot more tolerance for hiring outliers who can sometimes be amazingly productive. I had one person at Walk My Campus who literally his previous job was Blockbuster and this was renting out videos. It was not anything at headquarters. He just, but like incredibly smart person. And it was like, okay, this will take some extra time just in terms of training, in terms of integrating. It turned out to be an absolute rock star. 
in the end. Specifically in a startup where you're trying to grow very quickly, where management attention is always in very scarce supply, right? Having better managers uh, allows you to basically tolerate people that, that are more on the fringes. Just no, no complete assholes. That's been a big new thing for me, this company. I'm very skeptical. Okay, so to, just to rewind even further, I hate being told what to do. And as I have worked on companies, at some point I realized that I'm trying to build a company for younger me to work at, which may not really be the right way to do it. At another point, I realized that I'm in charge. So if I want engineering managers that don't tell people what to do, we can do that. It's totally a thing we can implement. But I think that one of the things this time around that's making life easier is I've just tried to embrace, see in my perfect world, everything's written down and obvious and there's like a FAQ for everything. And if someone asks a question, the answer is a link and there's just never any ambiguity. And I've been delighted to find out that one, that's not possible. I knew that, but I wasn't acting like it. And two, they're like with the right people, you can fill in those gaps like in real time when they need to be filled in. And you can actually get, I think a lot more quick information back about What's really messing people up or what's really hanging up? If someone's doing one-on-ones with seven people and someone else is doing one-on-ones with four people and you hear the same thing from both of them and suddenly this might be a thing to think about this week. Or, yeah, that's true, but that's fine. We're going to just roll with that sort of thing. And it's been amazing to be able to let other people notice problems and work on them instead of just keeping it all to myself, which previous me would have done. It's really great because th that is also something I'm thinking a lot about. So we have this value individual responsibility over process. And what I found is whenever you discuss something that could have been done better, in many cases, the kind of action item is let's implement a process, right? So it doesn't happen again. And this took me so long to really eradicate that type of thinking of saying no, because if we keep adding process at some point, we'll just die. And I think, but by the way, one of the things, great, we're recording this episode on the day that FDIC kind of took over a Silicon Valley bank. There is no FAQ for how to handle yourself in such a situation, right? There's no process like you just have to think about. But this is actually something that, especially for us early stage founders that still have smaller teams, that is possible to get people who are great at ownership and kind of this individual responsibility and have them take the reins a little bit and not implement too many processes because obviously those will always show up later. I love that. I love the, because uh, process tends to be accretive. Like it, you can add it, but you can never get rid of it. And so as soon as you're like, this is a problem, you don't even know it's going to be a problem again, but there's, you have a problem or something doesn't go well. It's like, oh, clearly the need, needed more process. And then I guess the trick is, you know, at a committee, right? <laughs> yeah. The trick is there's sometimes you do need process. The example that I used to use is, is like traffic lights is without traffic lights, traffic would be horrendous because you have to like go to every intersection and like figure out, okay, is some other car coming or whatever. But with the traffic light, when it's green, you can just go. And, and so it might slow you down sometimes, but so sometimes adding a little bit of process actually does make you go faster, but it's also, it's a really cool cultural value to just say, okay, res resist process for its own sake. And people coming out of big companies, especially, I think can have a really hard time adjusting to a lack of process. Yeah. And, but the way we go about this lack of process, because you're absolutely correct. Sometimes you have to. But the point is by default process will happen. So it's more about if you want to take the right hand side of our equation and our values, you should have a very good explanation of why you're choosing this path because the default should be the other way. I think there's often an additional sort of selection bias that a little bit where in the startup processes tend to be crappy in general, just because they're brand new, things are changing rapidly. Your design of process is already outdated because your organization looks different now. I've seen in large and stable companies in some areas, process work beautifully. It's like, I have a highly complex request, a lot of uncertainty that like, here's the checklist that we run down. And this gets driven to a good resolution in a short amount of time. You're like, oh, I wish I would have had that in my startup. But it doesn't quite work because he would define would be outdated fairly soon. Now, the other thing is, this process is only a creative that resonates incredibly with me, right? If you pile process on top of process on top of process. I've actually been in situations where we had to roll back process. For example, we had to, we have a large company. It's the early days of SaaS, right? And any software release takes a 60 day security review cycle. And you're like, well, that doesn't work, right? So you need to go in. So oh, we have to change this process and make it more lightweight. Epic battles ensue. You may have to get rid of a VP to get there. <laughs> it's, it's really difficult to do this in large companies, but it can be done. About the kind of where process starts to be important, I think Kiefer Boy has this framework that he said there's two types of leaders. There's the value creators and the, the value protectors. And I think when you're a large company and you have a monopoly, then yeah, actually becoming a value protector is very important. 
And that kind of brings me to my next question. I always struggle to understand whether culture is nature or nurture. What I mean by that is really culture is meant to select the right people for our organization and people fundamentally cannot change or people actually can change and it's about molding them to kind of the version that you want them. I hate the word or phrase people can't change. And I think one of the things we do when we talk about startups, we put everything in very absolute binary terms and almost nothing is actually like that. Our hiring process actually now tries to coach people through itself. And so the idea is not can or can't people change. More of the idea is if we give them the right guidance, can they do what they want as they get through this process? And I think a lot of this back to what I was saying about the 20 people I had harsh conversations with and two of them were amazing, is I actually think it's really important for us to find the people who are adaptable, I think, that are able to adjust what they're focusing on and what they're learning and even go against some ingrained stuff to do a really good job. There's a notable person in the world that's talked about doing sort of the counterintuitive thing with a reference to how backing up as a boxer is very difficult to do instinctively and almost everybody does it wrong. But the best boxers are the ones that learn how to do this thing that didn't make any sense to them. Actually, one of the things that really pushed us on this, we hire about 1% of the people who apply for jobs here. And we're like incredibly fortunate that we can get enough candidates. That's okay. Or we'd be like a company of six at this point and really unhappy. And a lot of what forced me to care about this particular thing was literally like, why can't we get more people through the hiring process? And if we can't, does it mean that we need to like compromise some of the things we're asking for? Or is there another path? And what we ended up doing was two things shockingly early for us. One is we actually hire way less experienced devs than I did at the last company. And I could talk for an hour about how much I did and like wrong there. At one point, someone criticized that company as being Lord of the Flies. So you can imagine how it was to work there. What we do is we scale down the selection criteria. We have three things we care about if you're a less experienced developer. And then we hope you can learn the rest over your time here. And then also basically tweaking the hiring process to make it a lot more two-way with feedback. I think that it's one of the interesting things about our process is we'll tell you how to do the next thing we're going to have you do successfully. What's actually shocking is how few people listen, it seems like, to that. But it got inflicted on us just because of the spot we found ourselves in trying to do one thing very well for the last year and a half. So I love the idea of, of having people actually learn in the interview. I think some of the most like amazing interviews that I've had and like in, amazing candidates have been ones that actually haven't been the best at getting the answer, but they're ones you can tell, oh, I didn't know this beforehand, but I'm going to apply something that I just learned and I'm going to come up with a solution. Maybe it'll be a different solution than you've seen before, but it's like when you see that happening, it's like a pretty special thing in, in an interview. And if you can capture that and actually have a process that can capture candidates that could do that. That sounds awesome. Regarding whether culture is nature or nurture, when we started Mother Duck, we wanted to be really diligent about the culture and build the right kind of culture. So like at our kind of, we're a remote team, we flew everybody in to Seattle as we're getting started. And, and we wanted to talk about, okay, what are the values that we want to create? And we couldn't do it. We were all over the place and it was like, oh, we want to do this and this. And in retrospect, it's obvious. We The culture has got to be, it can't be aspirational. It's got to be authentic and it's got to be a reflection of what we're actually doing. We're now eight months in. We have been able to come up with, we have three values that I think that we're happy with. And we're like, they're not perfect, but I think just having something and having something written down is is useful. But I think, so I think it's got to be an accurate reflection. It can't just be something you pick and say, okay, this is what the value, because you're not going to live it if it's just something you pulled out of a hat. Yeah, so let's switch to the final question for kind of this podcast is if you had to choose a place to work in a company based on culture alone, not the product, not the financial success, just the culture, what company would that be? Guido, we can start with you. Well, I can only compare the ones that I've been to. I certainly like the culture of the ones that I built myself. Big surprise. Uh, you probably have to ask somebody else if they would agree to that or if they thought it was horrible. But uh, there's a couple of things. First of all, I think it's incredibly hard to judge a culture from the outside, right? Because in some cases, 
it all seems happy and awesome office and lots of things and you can't get shit done because there's so much politics involved. It's very hard to see that if you're not in there, right? When I was there, I think VMware had a surprisingly good culture for a company of that size, right? So I was mildly impressed in how they managed that. And it was really hard, right? If the workforce that's distributed around the world, a lot of very different, like a 6,000 person sales organization back then, very hard to keep that aligned with an engineering organization that's, that's even larger than that. Yeah, but look, I think at the end of the day, in many cases, I voted with my feet to go to companies where I like the cultural leap from companies where I, why I didn't. And what was special about VMware? So there's a couple of things. One thing for an early stage startup, right? If it's just Kurt and 49 of his best friends, it's relatively easy to create a culture that is engineering driven, like modern, like that sort of has a common set of ideals. If you're 20 years old or give or take at VMware at that time, and you're operating lots of different countries and have very different job profiles, it's so much harder, if that makes sense, right? And over time, as you build these things, you have much less control as a CEO over it. You're no longer the original CEO anyways, right? So it's very difficult. And they just did a pretty good job in still being very engineering driven and really empowering the engineers. Pat was CEO back then. And one day I came to Pat because I said, look, my, the current laptop image we're using is just too damn hard to use for a developer, right? And compiling takes forever because we're antivirus crap. That's on there, right? And by the way, I did a micro survey of the divisional CTOs and VP engineering's 80% run their own image without IT, central IT knowing about it. I was like, all right, let's just change the policy of what an engineer can run on their computer. We're now going to have a self-managed device policy that does the following things. And that was interesting. So it was a clear trade-off decision of saying, hey, we care a little less about security and compliance and more about our engineers doing things. But for a company at that scale, it's really hard. We had a similar battle where it was like, a, a, can we accept credit cards for SaaS payments? Where initially the finance guy said, oh, that's completely impossible. And at some point, Raghu, who's now CEO there, basically said like, all right, these guys are going to launch and I don't care what finance says. If not, they can just do the completely own thing. It's a little bit, back then, they were a little bit engineering driven. And that was quite impressive to see at that scale. I think that highlights something interesting, which is I think that the function of culture is different in a later stage company that is an early stage company. Early stage company, it's really about hiring and who you attract. You're trying to get the best people for you and for what you're trying to build. But actually for a later stage company, it's actually about trying to make the business processes work smoothly. Like I think Amazon, I would not want to work at Amazon because of the culture, but I think for, a, for making it an incredibly successful company, they have a very successful culture. And I think so from a, who has a great culture by, one, by the definition of culture that it enhances your business, I think Amazon has a great culture. For the, from the definition of, hey, is this a great place to, to be an engineer and to build stuff? That's not where I would choose to, to go. Where would you choose to go? So it was interesting, like when, before I started Mother.com, like, all right, what am I going to do for my next job? I want to figure out a place that has a good culture. And I, lis I listened to a cu couple of podcasts by the, the CEO of Planet Scale, Sam, I can't remember his last name, but and, uh, the CTO also was, ha was on the same podcast. And wow, these guys just get it. There's just something, there's like a spark. There's a something about it. And I actually applied and I'm like, I'll take any job. And, and just because it seems like working, being in the door is better than having the title. And before I ended up interviewing there, I, I somehow some VCs threw some money at me to start a company and went off in a totally different direction that I hadn't foreseen. But but yeah, I think that's a company that seems to have great culture. And that's only based on two podcasts, but given the, the way culture often reflects the the values of the leaders, like that, to me, that was a good indication that that would be the kind of place where I'd want to work. Awesome. Kurt, how about you? I have a hot take, and this is again, limited experience, a lot of looking. I think most tech companies have really immature shitty cultures. And a lot of it is because a lot of the companies that are most successful, I don't want to say it was an accident. What happened is they got successful very fast. And I don't actually think the way they built the organization made them successful. I think at best it got out of the way of them being successful. And I think I'd want to work at a place that was very deliberately structured to accomplish something big, which would probably end up at AWS and hate it. I think there's a lot I really like about AWS. I do think for all of his faults, Jeff Bezos was very deliberate about how that company was put together to way more of a degree than any of their peers at the moment. But if I were really, really going to pick a company, it'd probably be a way out of like an REI, one of these very mm -hmm. experimental kind of organizational structures that works on distributing decision-making power as much as possible. I'm very fascinated with companies that really push decision-making out to everybody in a way that sounds terrifying to people. Yeah. So it's just to wrap up and not to avoid the question for me, I'm a culture nerd. So I probably would just choose a company that has 
a very strong culture. Like for me, it's actually more important that you live by your values more than what those maybe values specifically are, because I think those companies will tend to do better. So I was always, let's say, curious of how would it be to work for a company like Netflix. So that's probably the one I would choose if I have to pick. But Kurt, Joran, Guido, this was a great episode. I really enjoyed the conversation and thank you for joining us.